spirit. It is the spirit of Houdini we wish to contact. Are you here, Houdini? Please manifest yourself in any way possible. This man's mortal remains have lain in a grave for over 50 years. But men like him never die. spirit lives on in thousands of magicians all over America. Men and women who refuse to be bound by mere laws of nature. Another tap here, another tap here. We turn on, we took my magic wand tap went like so, I'd have a bouquet of flowers. A unique breed of people who have trained themselves to perform the impossible. One, two, three, three! We seem to be missing one. Weiss, the son of a Hungarian rabbi, changed his name to Harry Houdini. Only five feet, five inches tall, he became a giant in the world of magic. He could walk through brick walls. He caused elephants to vanish on stage. Handcuffs, leg irons, manacles of all sorts, even jail cells, failed to hold him. such a profound impact that more than 50 years after his last performance, he is still a magical presence. Today, people of all ages are performing incredible feats in the field that he pioneered. I'm Becky Blaney from Houston, Texas, and I'm 18, and I do magic part-time to work with South Bay College. I started magic in 1902, really. I tie the rope like that. And if I don't like that knot there, then I move it down there like that. If I don't like it there, I move it back over there like that, which is uh, sort of a funny little trick. That's a rope trick. <laughs> Harry Houdini departed this life on Halloween Eve, 1926. Every year, on the anniversary of this date, his closest friends and devotees have fulfilled a pact to hold seances. Allow everything to clear the mind. They believe that he, if anyone, can accomplish the ultimate escape from beyond the grave. Houdini's energy was inexhaustible. Every waking moment, he pursued his interests and investigations. Deeply struck by the death of his beloved mother, he spent many years trying to contact her ghost through various spirit mediums, and to his anger and disappointment, discovered them all to be fakes. From then on, he worked with Scientific American magazine, debunking the frauds like the spirit photographers of his day. 
he amassed one of the largest collections of magical paraphernalia in the world. And for the initiated, he opened a magic store, which you can still visit today if you can find it. Hidden away somewhere in New York City is Flossel's, the oldest magic store in America. It's very interesting to bear in mind that for about a hundred years or no longer, these tricks that you see here were kept a very dark secret. And magicians were very, very quick to get angry if anybody stole their equipment. For example, when Harry Houdini performed any place in the world, he had a black cyclorama cut off that even the stagehands who worked at the theater all the time couldn't look in, back and see the tricks. Although today we can bring our cameras into a magic factory to show you how these tricks are built, by the magician's code, we are not allowed to show you how they work. Take the raw materials and change them then to something that uh, a magician can use in his act. Little boxes, big boxes. So I'll check this out and see whether it works. No. I'm not a magician, you understand. I just work on the mechanics of this stuff. But in the hands of a professional magician on stage, that looks like magic. Now I've got one trick that you're really going to enjoy. What have I got now? We have the famous handkerchief trick. Now with this handkerchief, you can do some mighty amazing things. You can come over like that and just blow on them and it changes color. Isn't that a good trick? Right 375, that trick. And so, for just a few pennies, any would-be magician can get his or her career on the road. On the road is where magicians get their start. Hundreds of years ago, traveling performers earned their living from the streets. Houdini himself returned to the streets to perform many of his acts and to publicize his shows. A favorite crowd gatherer was his suspended straitjacket escape. Bill McQueen, a professional magician, earns his living from the streets of New York City. He made the soap disappear before my very eyes. Then he snapped his fingers like this, and uh, believe it or not, uh-huh, he made it come uh, right back again. Now, I was so amazed that my eyes were as big as half dollars. Anyway, this is precisely what my old man taught me how to do. With my sleeve rolled up, taught me how to push the material into my closed up fist like this. And of course, when I get it inside, taught me the proper gesture to make, how to make it vanish like this. Uh-huh. And of course, how to make it come right back again. Well, since then, I've done this little trick from Maine to Mexico, and people usually ask me the same question. They say, Bill, how do you do it? Well, it's no great secret. You see, I use sleight of hand, press the digitation, and ledger domain. It is going into my left hand. Then I show you nothing here just to get it out the way. Then I make it vanish from the left hand like that and reach out with the right hand and make it come right back again. And believe me, that is an illusion in every sense of the word. And me, I'm William McQueen. Thank you. Despite the television age, the traditions of the traveling entertainer still survive. Betty and I, my assistant and wife, travel around the country, and we live in the trailer. We travel about 40,000 miles a year and uh, park our trailer in trailer parks like this one. I was interested in magic as a child and uh, went through school and went into business and decided that I wanted to follow the direction of being a professional magician. I think there's a certain magic that's created when a group of people walk into an empty hall and the lights go on and the music goes on and the magician starts his show. Well, the broom suspension is a very, very old illusion. It was originally done with poles, two steel poles. And over the years, it uh, uh, changed from the poles to the broom. And it's an exciting illusion in the fact that uh, you can do it in the middle of the street.
from his earliest days, Houdini developed a fascination for locks and never tired of discovering how they work. He used to travel from town to town, accepting challenges to escape from every conceivable device. Milk cans, mail bags, packing cases. Even when bound in heavy chains and sunk underwater, Harry beat them all. To the frustration of the police and the joy of the press, he escaped, stripped nude, from the likes of the Chicago jail, the Department of Justice jail, even Scotland Yard. Early in his career, he was often broke and considered giving up show business for a more secure career. He even had to borrow the money for the license to marry his sweetheart, Bessie. When you delve into the history of magic, you keep discovering delightful characters like Monk Watson, who knew Houdini, performed at the same time he did, and is still performing today. Two cities claim me. Detroit claims I came from Jackson. Jackson claims I came from Detroit. I've got a little rope thing here that amazes me as well as the audience. Now you bring up one of the ends like this, and you bring it back down again, and this is the amazing part. Now you see we have two centers and two ends, which in itself is quite something. Uh, well, I don't remember that, but now we have three, three ends and one center. So we bring up that end, like that, and bring it back down again. Now we have three ends and still one center. Or, well, how do you like that? Instead of one rope, I now have two, which is amazing. Because you remember when I started, I only had the one rope look just like that, right? And if I tie a knot in the center, or near the center like that, and throw it in the air, now I got four ropes and three knots. And if I don't like that knot, I just blow it out. And that takes care of that rope. Put a ball in your hand like this, you know, apparently, and, and keep it in this hand. But if you do this, you see... Die Vernon, one of the two masters of sleight of hand. They think the ball is there and it's not there. But here's a little routine I used to do many, many years ago, a little routine where you, you do this and you do this. Now, the next time you do this, now you make this sucker move like this and you hold the wand very awkwardly. Everybody thinks that the ball is in that hand and you show it's here. It really is there. Then you spin the wand like this and you, then you really vanish it and then you produce it out of the wand. See? Doug Henning studied with Di Vernon and his subsequent smash Broadway hit, The Magic Show, made him the Houdini of the modern era. When I was traveling around the world studying magic, I, I first saw Di Vernon perform. And he was the first magician that I'd ever met that I felt was performing magic and not tricks. For instance, to make a coin appear from the air, he just wouldn't, he wouldn't show both sides of his hand and go through all kinds of contortions. He'd just see a coin, reach into the air, and there it was. And to make it vanish, it would just be gone. It would be magic. Now, if you put a coin in your hand like that, it looks as if you put it there, but you see, I didn't. I had it in this hand. Now there's another move where you take the coin this way, see? That's the pincette, that's the French name. Then this is a move that's called a slow motion coin vanish, because everybody thinks the quickness of the hand deceives the eye. Now I'll do this very, very slowly. Every move slowly done. Rather peculiar handling, but it looks funny. And then you produce the coin. In magic, there are techniques you have to learn, and then the magician has to learn to hide his technique. Now. When Dai hit his technique, he hit it behind his natural everyday movements. So it would look like real magic. And I think that's his really great contribution to the arts. He taught me to do magic and not just do tricks. What turns the student into a master is one ingredient, showmanship. The appearance of association with dark forces always creates a nervous tingle of anticipation in the audience. Watch now as the late Dante performs the macabre task of sawing a lady in half. The unforeseen happens, such as an accident, you are equally responsible with me. I didn't do a thing. You didn't, uh, pinch her? Did you take her feet? Must have struck a rib.
We cut it too close. Pull out the feet gently, please, about two or three inches. Ah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Young man wants to do the two halves. Pick up the box. And let go of the feet. Move the feet now. And to satisfy you that they're real flesh and blood, move the toes. <laughs> move the left foot, the right foot, both feet. And move the hands, that is right. Mm -hmm. Please. Thank you, Kevin. And you likewise. Feet, please. and paraphernalia can capture the audience's imagination, but when they are put away, the complete conjurer is able to stand alone on stage and spellbind his audience. Witness the skill of misdirection, honed to perfection by Shimada. Once you've invested the agonizing days of disciplined practice, the biggest reward is the expression of amazement created by you on the faces of your audience. Houdini could never be accused of hiding behind a veil of modesty. He used every means at his disposal to promote his personality. The first magician to realize that the silver screen could magnify his image and his earnings, he created such films as The Man from Beyond and The Grim Game. In these silent film escapades, he often repeated feats he had accomplished in real life. Daring exploits and on-screen romances with maidens in distress were the final reinforcement of his reputation. He was at the peak of his career. But in the most ironic of circumstances, he became a victim of his own showmanship. Harry would invite men to test his strength by punching him in the stomach. One unexpected blow ruptured his appendix fatally. Walter Gibson is one longtime friend who believes Harry may yet accomplish his final challenge and escape from the spirit world. Houdini has failed to communicate with his supporters. Despite their disappointment, Walter Gibson and friends have faith enough to return next year. I knew Houdini. He was performing this water torture cell. The water chamber was Houdini's ultimate act. Its memory is kindled by every magician 
who seeks to carve a niche in magic history. He carried the audience with him. They believed he was going to do something miraculous, and he generally did. The most amazing feat was the water torture cell. When he came in, he had to have his feet locked in the stocks. He was locked, and he was hauled up, and he hung upside down about this. Take deep breaths, hanging upside down. And then he'd clap his hands three times. And that meant lower him in. Then down he would go in the splash. And then the assistants went into action. There were three or four of them jumping up and clamping this thing. And then they would throw curtains around it. In about three minutes, he would emerge completely free, and you could still see the locked cell just as when he went into it. Now let us watch one man attempt his ultimate challenge by pitting himself against the thundering gorge of Niagara Falls. Only a few have dared to defy this awesome chasm. Some have lived to be acclaimed for their achievements, others have not.
James Randi, America's foremost escape artist and magician, has succeeded at something never before attempted. His accomplishment, too, will last beyond his own lifetime. In this technological age, it is reassuring to discover that magic, the ancient art of creating wonder, still thrives thanks to one man's enduring spirit. Houdini never died. He just vanished.